All right. Um, it's like the same for the people that came in late. Me and Kyle are going to do a um, little session on denominations. We're going to talk about like the history of them, just briefly, if it's helpful, like Methodism. The history is very helpful, so we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about what they believe, kind of how that compares to our beliefs. And then um, we're thinking it'll be pretty practical because um, it's like, I, I know a lot of Methodists, you know what I mean? I'm sure like we run into people that believe these sorts of things. So it's been helpful for me just kind of like studying it a little bit. So, hey everyone, do we have enough room? Yeah, we have some seats right here. These are nice seats. I have it a lot of times, or I used to before I started studying this, like, I don't really know what the Reformed believe, and I just kind of thought of them as, like, straight determinists, you know, they, all they think about is no free will and that sort of thing, and then <laughs> once I started reading, like, especially Calvin and those guys, like, you get an appreciation for what they believe, and I can actually have a conversation with them instead of just, like, steel manning them, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, we're going to do that with Methodism right now, which I thought would be a good one to do, because um, they're... They've had a lot of changes within their denomination. So, um, yeah, started from where they've started off, they're in a very different spot. So history is important on this one. It's going to be a little history dense, but um, for the first few slides at least. But then we're going to get into the practical aspects of it. I know Sarah's already saying that she went to Methodist churches. So our goal for me and Cal in this class is to have it, you know, be um, interactive. So you guys have questions asked. I definitely have time built in for that. So if we don't, we're going to get out early. So um, I would appreciate questions. Um, Cal is in Germany right now, so he's not going to be here today. Um, but Switzerland. Switzerland? Oh, he's in Switzerland right now. Okay. <laughs> but uh, typically, we will like have two different perspectives for this class. Um, for those of you that haven't attended before, where it's my perspective and Cal's perspective, and we'll do different parts of it. But right now, you guys are going to get a completely biased opinion from me. So. <laughs> but uh, let's open up in prayer, and then we can get started. Dear Father, thank you for this day. Um, thank you that we can all come together and um, learn about some of our brothers and sisters in Christ and just some of the things that they believe, Lord. Pray that we'll be able to get some practical application out of this as well as some good conversation and that um, we can more effectively be the body of Christ with um, just some diverse, not only people groups, but also ideas. Just stand and pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right, so Methodism. Before I get too started into this, I do, like, I'm sure all of you guys kind of have, like, a small opinion on Methodism, at least before we come here, maybe a big opinion, but um, I do want to say that it's a very complicated topic, and I think we should take each doctrine or, like, idea that they believe with, uh, in, like, an isolation chamber, you know what I mean? So, like, just take, like, that idea and say whether that idea is good or bad before we say, like, oh, Methodists are good or bad, you know what I mean? Because they certainly have some things that we're going to talk about today that our church strongly disagrees with, right? But the majority of it, especially historically, would be very similar to what we believe. So I just want to start off saying that because um, there's, uh, it's important to know where they went bad and try to avoid those mistakes too because it's a very gradual process, as you'll see, from where they started as this really solid church in, in Britain and kind of descended into the church where we have now, 
where we're seeing some of the largest denominational splits that we've seen in the history of the church and just in the last year, 2024. So um, Methodism started from these two guys right here. So it's the Wesley brothers, all right? You got John Wesley and Charles Wesley. Um, it started in the 18th century um, during the Protestant revival. So there was three main Protestant traditions that started in the early 18th century, all in Britain, right? You're gonna have the Baptist, specifically the Southern Baptist, you're gonna have the Methodist, which are these guys right here, and then you're gonna have like, the modern Reformed Church, which is gonna be coming from like the Calvin line, right? So the Methodists, well, so to back up a second, in Great Britain at the time, if you wanted to be a Protestant or you wanted to be a Christian in general, you had to be a part of the Church of England, right? Which is the, um, what's that church we were just talking about? It. Anglican Church, yeah. yeah. So it's the Anglican Church, which in America, uh, at the same time, they called themselves the uh, Episcopalian Church, yeah, because they just didn't want to be associated with the British at all, right, at that time. So um, the Wesley brothers came from a, pretty affluent household, right? Like the dad was a pastor and the mom was very, very pious. And they would sit down with the parents multiple times throughout the week for the kids, each kid, there's like 10 kids. And they would teach them different doctrines and like what, um, how to be a good Christian and those sorts of things. Um, as they got older, they were both brilliant men and they went to Oxford. And in Oxford, they studied theology and um, that sort of thing. And Specifically, John Wesley studied those sorts of things. He really into it. Charles Wesley was a very gifted musician. He would write hymns and that sort of thing as well. But they decided that they were going to create like a little like men's group or like a Bible study at their college, and it really took off. And it's all about personal responsibility and um, focus on doctrine and these sorts of things. Um, and it was created as a response to the dying Anglican Church at the time in the 18th century. The Anglican Church was not doing great. They were having some you know, fights and that sort of thing inside their churches. And um, so they wanted to get back to the basics, of biblical teaching. It's very like this reformed thought, like, you know, we're going to be the ones that are going to get the doctrine back into society. And to be honest, they, they did it well. Like, they were solid. And Wesley, um, especially, or, uh, uh, John Wesley, especially, really had, um, had a head on him. So um, I want to make sure I get all my points here. They would, in their, in their little small group, they do things like communion once a week. They would do pr prison ministry. They would give money to the poor. Um, they strongly emphasized biblical teaching. The Bible was the root of everything. Um, and then in, so in the 19th century though, they, which is right after the, the Wesleys died, um, they saw a, um, a rise in what's called the nonconformism. So that's gonna be those three, three denominations that I talked about. So um, which is gonna be the Methodist tradition, the Reformed, and the, um, the Baptist. And in this society, we started to see the rise of what are called chapel societies. So this mostly hit, took place in Great Britain and in America, where you had the entire society around the church, right? So there's these little like towns and everyone's kind of in the church the community. They started to marry each other. And with that, Methodism just starts to take off, right? So, Methodism becomes very popular in the Americas right after the Wesleys died. And um, what's like kind of ironic about it is a lot of these traditions came from Great Britain, from these missionaries. They would, um, like uh, Whitfield is the one that kind of got reformed into America, and they came and were very successful. Um, they would come to like, uh, like Massachusetts and those sorts of states, and they would plant churches, and it just grew and grew and grew and grew. But the Wesleys came to Georgia by the person that was running Georgia at the time, I can't remember his name, and just failed miserably. Like they just could not get a church there. Actually ended up moving back to Great Britain, starting their church there, mm -hmm. and then after they died, it got pushed to America. So that's right where you start to see the Methodist church really start to take off, is in the early 19th century. Um, Did you do much research on the Moravians? They I were very influenced by the Moravians, but I don't know much about the Moravians either. Yeah, I didn't. I know okay. I know there's a lot, like we were just talking about, what was the other ones that split off from them? Nazarene. Um, the Nazarenes, yeah. So that's actually a great point, though. So at this time, you pretty much had the Anglican Church <coughs> in the beginning, the beginning of the 18th century. Um, then there were really three denominations that broke off, like I said. And those were the big three. But as time starts to go on, <coughs> they just start splitting more and more and more. And now we have like something like a thousand denominations. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of influence and stuff going on here. What I'm saying is a very simplified idea. But in the beginning, in the 18th century specifically, they weren't a church at all. They weren't even a denomination. They actually still were under the Anglican Church, which I'm going to get to. 
um, in a little bit here. So, uh, so you got the chapel society, the Methodism starts to grow in America. Um, and then that puts us to the end of the 19th, or to the beginning of the 19th century. So, uh, the, uh, unsurprisingly, I guess the Methodists become very involved in politics, right? So, but it's actually like pretty solid, like liberal politics for the time. So that was the sort of industrial revolution and sort of having these working conditions where these kids are in these factories and it's really rough, you know, and the um, Methodists were some of the ones that came along and said, hey, you know, that's not good. We really should be looking for reform here. And they were a huge part to play in the Americas of getting working conditions in the industrial revolution. Um, they also were really big into women's rights. They were a huge influence in the suffrage movement. And they were also one of the main players in the, um, the what's it called, teetotalitarianism, <laughs> the, the absence from alcohol <laughs> movement. Yeah. So, um, yep, yep, that one. So they were um, very, very active. What's interesting about that kind of liberal leaning is we never see that end, right? So it's very aggressive in the beginning, which I think we would all agree were very strong biblical points, right? Like no access alcohol, even though they might have gone a little extreme there. Um, you know, something like kids shouldn't be working 24-hour days. And, you know, <laughs> it's fine, yeah, get them back in there. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but they just kind of, they kind of just kept going. So that would be in the 19th century. Um, in the 20th century, so this is right in the beginning of the 1900s, Methodism comes under attack of the Enlightenment, right? The Enlightenment thoughts, rationalism, these sorts of things, and it just takes off the church. It just takes a huge hit. Drops from like a million members um, to less than 200 or 350,000 members. No, you're good. Um, so this, this kind of brings the Methodists, which was this, this idea, less than a denomination, and, and like separate churches, uh, kind of like what we are with like the, the GGF, you know, where we like have like an affiliation into an actual denomination. So they're like, we need to fix this, we need to get some unity. They come together in 1932 and actually create the, um, the Methodist Church, the United Methodist Church. Um, and then as we get into the later 1900s, we see in 1973, the church ordained women in the latter half of the 20th century, um, overseas churches, which were planted from a large mission work in the 19th century, they actually accepted into the church. So, uh, missions in the 19th century, if we could kind of like look at it from like an archetype view or like, uh, you know, I, I was kind of weird to say that, like, uh. If we're gonna generalize, like it was like the Westerners would go to Africa and they would cut through the, the forest and get the savages and you know mm -hmm. civilize them, right? It was huge. So especially out of Scotland. I mean, these yeah. Guys, I mean, they were just obsessed. They left their children, they left their families, uh -huh. they went to places you never heard of, and they never came back. Yeah, so, yeah. Like David Livingston, he was Scottish, wasn't he? So uh, I'm not sure. Remember, so we, uh, oh yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, backtracking a little bit, mm -hmm. they came from a family of like 14 kids or something. 14 kids, and, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and her mother homeschooled, homeschooled all of them, and they were brilliant. I mean, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah, I'm going to get into the last yeah. a little bit in a second here, but um, but yeah, so it comes from a big family. The, like I said, the mission work was very much like, you know, cut through the jungle, very, uh, like, a, it's a movie-esque, like, grandeur of that. But towards the end of the 20th century, the Methodists really took a step back, I think, quite well and said like, hey, these are actually people over here and they're very smart people, they should be a part of our church rather than like these underlings. So at the end of the 20th century, they've kind of accepted everyone into their church. So the United Methodist Church is in Africa yeah. and that sort of thing as well. Um, okay, that brings us to the 21st century. Um, in the 21st century, the Methodist Church started to change quite dramatically. Uh, discipleship in small groups is a huge deal in the Methodist mm -hmm. Church, especially in Great Britain. So they really emphasize small groups um, where that's going to be heavy theology and accountability and these sorts of things. It's really solid still, right? Like I said, there's some the Methodists, they get some things right. Uh, also the diversity, they emphasize diversity is a, a very important thing. Um, I know like our church tries to do that, but if you look around, we're all white sitting here, except for Julia. So. <laughs> so the Methodists are actually quite good at it. Um, and they do bring it all together and they do still have unity in this uh, the uh, doctrines that they have together. So, because they're a real denomination. I mean, they have like, their ordained ministers, like 900 of them. It's not like where you have our church and we have our elders. It's like one church might have one ordained person there. It's the denomination. It's very strict. Uh, just like the Reform, the CRC, anything like that, the Catholic Church, it's, where it's very centralized. Same thing for the Methodists. 
Um, like I said, Charles Wesley was a brilliant hymnist. So um, he, so first of all, I do want to talk about the hymns. That we can't underestimate like how influential these hymns were, right? So I think a good way to compare it is like Hillsong. So does everyone kind of know Hillsong Church here? So Hillsong is, if you guys watch a documentary on it, I would encourage you to do so. It's definitely not a Christian documentary, but it can kind of show the fall of some of these churches. But they write amazing music. I mean, it's really catchy, and it's like half the songs we sing in our church is Hillsong. But the doctrine of the church, Hillsong specifically, was quite bad, and the church really fell apart in the last couple of years. So um, even with a church that had that bad a doctrine, those songs were really able to bring people in. Methodists did have good doctrine, but we should be careful with saying that was why people came to the Methodists, right? That the hymns were solid, like they were a big deal. Uh -huh. um, so hymns are still to this day very important. In Britain specifically, they still read actually Charles' hymns from you know, whatever year it was, 17 something. Yeah. Um, they're also proudly Protestant, very, very Protestant. You know, roots go right back to the Reformation and they're strongly Arminian actually. So people don't know this, but um, the Arminian is a free will one. Like, we're very Arminian as well, and you can pretty much always trace those roots directly back to John Wesley. John Wesley was like the real proponent of free will in uh, Protestant circles. Um, some today still don't consider Methodism to be a church, but uh, they consider themselves to be a church, so I think we probably should consider them to be a church. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, it is also very different from what Wesley started. So I know I went through that fast and there's a lot of information, <coughs> but that was also my point. Um, just to do the history as quick as possible, to kind of see how they came through. <coughs> now, and I go to my next slide. Jack, do you know when, when they formed, officially formed as the United Methodist, mm -hmm. was, I'd always heard that that was a merger of, of sort of two denominations, but is yeah. that the case, or is it, is so, it just the Methodist Church is just <coughs> together, so we're going to make it official? Yeah, so uh, I did read on it a little bit, but again, I'm not an expert. Like, I think about this class, thanks for bringing that up, first of all. Um, I am, I'm a CPA, I'm certainly not an expert in theology, so I have time to go and do this research and I'm giving it as a cliff notes, so if you ask great questions like that, I'm going to sometimes say, I don't know, but I did see some stuff on that, and I think that's true. Do you know what the, the two denominations were? I don't um, United something, but it wasn't not the UCC, because they still yeah. exist. Uh huh. I can't remember what it was, but I think there was also more than two. My dad said the United Brother, but they still exist too, so yeah, maybe something too. similar to that. But sometimes when you have those mergers, like there'll be a group of people that will still hold on to that whole identity, whereas mm -hmm. the majority of them come mm -hmm. over. So I don't know, but but yeah, it was. I think you're right. There was like two main ones, but there was also like small splinter groups of Methodists, you know, that kind of came together but too. And you have their cousins, the Wesleys. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the Wesleys as well. Right. Let me get to another time. But. Uh -huh. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. They kind of went left and right. You know, one mm -hmm. was pretty liberal, one stayed pretty conservative. That's kind of... Yeah, that's a great way to look at it. Uh -huh. But the Wesleyans sure. being conservative. So, they, um... I yeah. Can't, I can't remember what that was, but it happened during my childhood. Oh, did it? Because we went to a Methodist church way out in the boonies. Uh-huh. In farm country. Okay. So that must have been the union of the two denominations. Yeah, and I can't remember what the other one was. Okay. And isn't the Methodist Church, isn't there two fractions of a more conservative? No, you're liberal? thinking of the... Uh, oh, yeah. See, I was raised free Methodist. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, that, that is the one. My yeah. grandfather was a free Methodist minister. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Which is more conservative. More so conservative. More conservative. More conservative. Okay, more you're right. Because Methodists themselves will make that yeah. distinction. Yeah, I was about to say, will. I'm talking about the United Methodists, too. So that's a right. very important yeah. distinction. This is all about United Methodism. It's a big one. So, um... But I thought you were thinking of uh, Presbyterian, but are you talking about Methodist? Well, I think I think it's the same thing too. Right? Yeah, I know that. I think it's the pre-Methodist that is the conservative. Yeah. I mean, they they They're consider more, themselves separate, but they yeah. they have I mean, the free Methodists had to break away. They from were the, they were all right. United so, the uh, most conservative. Direct from the internet. Got Google. Here we go. It means it's true. So, 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 the United Methodist Church <laughs> in the United States. Uh -huh. Formed in 1968 in Dallas. Okay, so it's much later. By then. the Union of the Methodist Church and the Evangelical United Brethren Church. Oh, oh that's Brethren. Oh, okay. that's Brethren. Okay. There you go. So the Evangelical United Brethren. Okay. But the United Methodist Church, I had a date that was like 32 or something like that. So 
Um, I'm wondering if they were wrong before that as well, but. I think before that, I keep tracing was, back there. Yeah, well, but that goes back to our point in the beginning is like, you had these three main denominations that started in the early uh, 18th century, and then you just start to see splits, 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 splits. And, oh, yeah. um, yeah. Right, I know that. So I can't remember what philosopher said that, but they might have been Nietzsche. Or, or no, it's Carl Jung. So Carl Jung said um, that that's just a logical conclusion of Protestantism, right? Is that if you're going to have Catholicism, the logical <coughs> conclusion is going to be tyranny. Like you're gonna, if you're going to bring everyone under the Pope and the Pope gets to speak for God, you're going to have tyranny, which is exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. But then as Protestantism started, he said you're going to have advert liberalism, right? You're going to have people that are going to believe whatever they want to believe. You're going to see splinters of everything, 100% right, yeah. right? So, um, so you're, I mean, we watched that from Wesley starting, and now we have Wesleyism and Methodism. They both directly trace the roots back to Wesley. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting. But um, yeah, great points. Thanks for the discussion to people. Because um, the, they're like, yeah, when I'm reading it too, like the I'm, I'm reading, trying to find what the Methodists themselves believe, the United Methodists. So all these discussions are helpful for me too to to bring it out um, more uh, digestibly. So. Um, so like I said, we went through the history of it really briefly. We're gonna go back now to what they actually believed when they started. And I think this is gonna show how we can get to where they are today, what they believe, and as you guys are bringing out, like this is United Methodist, it's very different from the, from the Freedom Methodist, right? So um, I just wanna make sure I didn't miss anything here. Discipleship is still a very important thing and diversity of the church was as well. Um, in, okay. the, in the beginning, they were somewhat linked to the Puritans, I think, to oh, really? some degree, because um, they they just had nothing to do with Church of England. They had liturgy, uh -huh. they set that aside, and they, they followed the European model, the continental model of of, um, of Protestantism, Calvin and Luther, uh -huh. their form of Protestantism. So yeah. I, think, I think they were somewhat linked to... Um, that, in, in, it, it wouldn't surprise me. To the, to the Puritans, uh -huh. which we, we always think of Puritans, we always think of the, the Pilgrims. Yeah, uh -huh. no, they were, this is totally different. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Down, down south, uh, which is Baptist is really popular, and, uh, and Methodist is too, it, it felt very, I attended both churches okay. in my younger days, and they felt very similar to each other. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the Methodist church in practice felt pretty evangelical, actually. Um, yeah, well, it's back in yeah. the day. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's kind of a shock to the system yeah. to see <clears throat> how some of them have turned so left. So. Yeah, well, yeah, and that's what I hope to talk about a lot today, because I think that, which I'd have time, so, <laughs> But I think that's a very, I think it might be the biggest danger to the American church today is how they ended up where they are. Because they're not the only ones that did that. Also, the Episcopalians have done it and the form of dabbling in it right now. Yeah, right. So um, it's very important to realize how gradual it is. And that's why I'm starting back in the early 1900s, as you see. Um, that's where we're going to spend a lot of our time. So um, I'm going to go back to the early beliefs, first of all, though, because I want to show you how solid they were when they first started. So, like I keep iterating, like I I love John Wesley. Like I think oh, I would have yeah. been like right there with him if he, yeah. if he was doing his stuff. So just a, a couple slight things that he did that I don't love, but like he's he's a brilliant man. So um, early church. So um, John first joined the Anglican Church when he was in Oxford. Um, then he came to Georgia, like I said, under the founding of Georgia to preach to the Native Americans and just totally failed. So they're like, all right, you know, this didn't work and they've written on it so that they didn't do great. Brothers moved back to Great Britain and this is where Methodism really starts to take its roots. Um, John, in, um, in the Great Britain, John has this conversion experience where he's like, you know, everything we're doing at the Church of England is not working. We need to get back to our roots of what it means to be Protestant and what it means to be Christian. So he starts preaching and working within the Church of England for Reformed. But that's when he meets George Whitfield. So does, any, does everyone kind of know George Whitfield? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he's another amazing. Another amazing man. Uh -huh. Calvinistic. Yeah, yeah. Right. So it's very significant his, uh, historically. Yeah. Exactly. And as you hit on Calvinists, so you have Wesley, which is like Wesleyism, Arminianism, mm -hmm. and then you have Whitfield. And these guys kind of join forces immediately and just start like making waves in, in Great Britain. Really solid Protestant waves about uh, good theology, uh, biblical teaching, which we're going to get into more of the nitty gritty in a bit here. But um, discipleship. 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 
Discipleship is huge, small groups, I mean, the uh, accountability, just really good stuff. Um, so John Whitfield was actually already doing this, and he invited, or George Whitfield was already doing this, and he invites John to participate in this open air teaching where they leave the church and they go out into like just the villages, and they would get up and just preach super charismatically, and they would get these huge crowds. And Wesley actually didn't like it at first. He was kind of against it, because he's like this classic, you know, Anglican preacher. And he kind of eventually just falls into it with a Whitfield. And I'm sure we could talk about an entire class on that as well. But in the end, he ends up doing the same thing. And um, they're very influential, everything's going well, but they just can't get past this Arminian and Calvinistic debate, which is just the story that we see in all of Protestantism, right? So Whitfield is strongly deterministic, no free will, God ordains everything, only the elector in here. And Wesley's like, nope, you have free choice, but also really influences or emphasizes the eternal security, just like our church, right? So um, they get into a fight, they end up splitting, and this is a story, I don't know, it's not proven, but uh, the, the sentiment between these two men is definitely proven between their writings. So it said that um, there was a man that asked Whitfield if he thinks he'll see Wesley in heaven because of how they split and how he's strongly Arminian, and he told him, no, I'm not going to see Wesley in heaven because he's going to be so much closer to Christ and I'm going to be way in the back. Cause, oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a really cute story. So they're very good friends. It's just that within their ministry, they weren't able to work it out. And they still had great respect for each other as um, reformers, you know, some of the greatest reformers. Um, so, yeah, that's Whitfield. And then, so Wesley then splits on his own. Starts doing this Arminian teaching, still much of the same type of solid teaching and very Protestant, like I said, definitely pulling away from the Anglicans. Um, so Whitfield stayed within the Anglican church then? I can't, no, oh. Whitfield's reformed. So you probably can speak on that. I thought he was the I thought he was the groundwork for the Presbyterians. Yeah, yeah. Presbyterian. So the Presbyterian CRC. Whitfield, I thought. Yeah, all the Reformed tradition, which is definitely Presbyterian. There's CR, all the Reformed ones as well. Um, even Reformed Baptists will be able to trace themselves right back to Whitfield. All right. So if you're going to see the traditions starting to display here, you got your Arminian traditions, the Wesleyans, the Methodists coming from here. And then you have reform traditions, but it's also not that simple because we actually trace from one age back to Calvin in Whitfield, right? As Roman Bible Church, we come from the reform tradition, and we're like very Arminian, so mm -hmm. it gets very complicated when you actually get you know 300 years later. But um, that's the you know, put your blinders on simplistic way to think about it. It's got these three men, different traditions, starting to breach out. Um, but we're focusing on the, the Wesleyan tradition right now. So so Wesley branches out and. Um, just starts to grow like crazy, but he will not leave the Anglican Church. He thinks it's a movement, the Methodist movement. And it's actually a publication in like the, the London Times or something that called them like the Methodists because it's like their method of teaching was like a very different way. And that's kind of just stuck. And that's where the term Methodism came from. But they're not a denomination. They just kind of do this open air teaching, very powerful. And his brother is just bringing these like just rockers of hymns, and everyone's like, you know, loving the hymns and stuff. So it's just a party. <laughs> and um, so his big things that Wesley cared about was um, the old emphasis on assurance of salvation, the power of the Holy Spirit to um, help us obtain a perfect love for God and others. Um, so I want to make sure that this is where I'm going to talk about this. <coughs> And that's probably um, from the, their symbol is always the flame on the cross. Yeah. That's probably the emphasis on the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Um, okay, no, I'm going to talk about this later. But yeah, so those are the, yeah, the Holy Spirit is big in them. But it's not this kind of like charismatic Holy Spirit that we think about. It's very grounded and very good theology. And I want to talk about that a little bit because um, I think they get that. I think we could have rock solid, and it's my, that's my biased opinion. It'd be nice to have Cal here to be able to check me on that one, but it's like, I think they got it right. Um, so, but, so those are the core tenets. That starts to bring a strain with the Church of England, because those are not the core tenets of the Church of England. All right, and they just kind of start to fight, and there's definitely a strain there, but it doesn't break until the death of Wesley. So when Wesley dies, um, they had just started towards the end of Wesley's life, starting to ordain their own pastors. And when they were ordaining their own pastors outside of the Church of England, that was a big deal for the Church of England, right? So they cut them off. They become their own 
like uh, almost Southern Baptist type convention y, like not a denomination, but like a convention almost, where they kind of have their core beliefs and they set churches, and then they would ordain their own ministers, which is much more like a actual denomination. This is like quasi denomination. Um, and then what's very interesting about this, so the, the Methodists, when they first started with Wesley, was all to the poor. So they'd go into the poor villages, do this charismatic speaking and stuff, and they would get huge members coming to their church but they were ultra-disciplined people that really cared about the core tenets of the Bible, and the people start to get rich because of these tenets that they're doing right. So it's like hard work, frugality, saving your money, giving to the poor. And within like two generations, the Methodists are no longer this poor, um, you know, denomination of, of the peasants that starts to become a middle class um, mm -hmm. uh, society, basically. So it just changes the demographic pretty much immediately within about two generations. Um, yeah, so but they still they still definitely did the frugal living and um, but it was a major demographic shift. So um, I'm going to get to the core beliefs now. But does anyone have any questions on the early start of Wesleyanism? No. I worked through part of that the United Brethren mm -hmm. merging with the Methodists and then trying to talk to people about eternal security and. Mm -hmm. um, not being able to grasp it. Uh -huh. oh, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, I've got to do this. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Saved and all. Yeah. I believe Jesus died and was resurrected. Right. Then you're saved. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we do what we need to do mm -hmm. because of the Holy Spirit yeah. and His power in our lives. Mm -hmm. That was really hard for them to stretch their mind around. Right, is it because of like the liturgy and stuff, or why do you think that was hard just, for them? Just as a family speaking to individuals that were really mm -hmm. struggling with that. Oh yeah, that's interesting. <coughs> I, want, I wonder what the tension is there. Is it like the free will because they have a choice to choose, and like that means they could choose not to follow, do you think? Or? They wouldn't have put it in that term, in those terms. Uh -huh. They have been taught differently. Hmm. Yeah. So I wonder if it's, it's the emphasis on, on holiness. Oh, right. yeah. You're always mm -hmm. oh, yeah. striving to be holy. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of, as kind of John said many times, we, we easily believe we're saved by faith, but then we think we have to get the work and mm -hmm. make ourselves holy. Yeah, 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 maybe. Um, I, I do want to get into that a little bit because even though I think Wesley came at it from a very good perspective, I could see how the layman would definitely fall into like just straight legalism because even though his theology is really good, he takes a very interesting approach to it, which as like a theology nerd myself, I eat it up. But I also understand how you got to have a pretty, pretty uh, like scholarly knowledge of the history of the Bible to be able to get to that spot. And Wesley, of course, is a brilliant man. Um, so I don't want to, I don't want to like, critique him necessarily, but I guess I could say I could sympathize with that point of view of how you could get there. You know. So just people in the congregation. Right, yeah, it's normal congregants. And it had a huge effect on my life because this was, this was the mother of the guy I was doing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. People were awfully fixed in their opinions back then. We have to remember that. My mother mm -hmm. said her father and her grandmother, one was a Methodist and one was a Baptist, and they wouldn't take communion together. Oh, oh really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that was mean. I mean, it That's crazy. Yeah. So that how fix these people were in their theology. We're talking yeah. 150 years ago. Yeah. 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 That implies that they don't believe the other ones were Christians because you can yeah. take them. Oh, whatever. Christians. I think, yeah. yeah. It's, it's incredible. incredible. Is it really theology? Uh -huh. I'm not going to get too far off track. But yeah. my, my grandparents, mm -hmm. they were Methodists. Mm -hmm. And they had a little church called the Bethel Church. Mm -hmm. And they had a little church called North Blendon, just a little ways from here. There's a Christian Reformed Church and a Reformed mm -hmm. Church mm -hmm. yeah. right next to each other. One of my grandparents <laughs> went to one, one went to the other. But and those two churches did nothing to do with each other. And then my yeah. grandfather got soured on church because he was pretty much disowned for marrying a reform gal when he was that's, first reformed. That's wild. Yeah. 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 You know, unity within these denominations is kind of a modern idea, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it used to be. I mean, way worse. I mean, they're bringing up the state. Calvin is like my favorite theologian of all time, even though I disagree with him on almost everything. <laughs> so, but he, but yeah, I love, love that. That's not true. I agree with like 90% of what he says. I just don't like the determinism. But he burned someone at the stake, or at least like said he should. You know, it's just crazy to think about. Well, to go along with that, like 
I, my dad was a pastor, so I was raised in the Baptist church, but when mm -hmm. I started going to the Protestant Reformed Church, they would not allow me to take communion oh, yeah. until I became a member. For sure. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. And took the class. Yeah. So yeah. I had to go through their class. Mm -hmm. And um, they they did accept my baptism. Oh, they they did. They did. Yeah. I, I didn't think they were going to. So but. Calvin writes in this is Christian religion. I'm just wrapping it up right now that um, it doesn't matter where you get baptized. So it is interesting. Oh. He would be okay with that. If you're baptized in the Catholic Church, feel free to join him. But communion was a much bigger mm -hmm. deal for him. Yeah. So so yeah. Um, I'm gonna keep going a little bit here because um, got about 15 minutes here. But um, I want to get to the core beliefs quickly, and then I want to get to the liberal drift because that's where the church is today. So um, the core beliefs is like sanctification. Sanctification, for those of you that have studied any sort of uh, systematic theology, that term, if it's helpful for you, is exactly what Wesley would push. Um, what, for people that don't know what that is, it's the process of becoming like Christ. It's obviously more complicated than that, but, um, but it, that's kind of the, the idea. So Wesley had this term that was called um, perfect love. And it's that the, the power of the Holy Spirit can, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can take, uh, obtain actual perfection, and um, so, and I think this might. I think this is super crucial here. So um, he gets. He's going to get these from like Matthew forty-eight. I think I have this here. And so yeah, Matthew forty-eight is be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect, and he's talking about that after talking about loving others. So this is an actual command that like you know you should be perfect. Um, and then in Philippians one nine through eleven, um, and this is my prayer that you love. Um, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight that help you determine what is best so that um, in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, right? There's your perfection language. Having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and the praise of God. So um, this is the topic of becoming like Christ. And even Wesley himself wouldn't say that people actually attain this, right? It's like this is a slow, gradual, as Pastor John was talking about today, a process of becoming like Christ, who is blameless. So we kind of got this upward movement. Um, so I think it, I'm going to briefly talk about this. The, I think a good way to conceptualize this is actually starting with Ecclesiastes, because that kind of chapter or that book is talking about what's the purpose of life. And he goes through everything that he's done to gain purpose in life, and he even says things like, at the end of verse one or chapter 1, he says, um, uh, wisdom, wisdom, and uh, knowledge are, are vain because they only <coughs> vexation and sorrow, which means it's going to bring you sadness and torment if you're going to be wise and intelligent. But then he kind of gets to the end of it and says, um, uh, "So uh, fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the full duty of man." So, mm -hmm. but his ultimate conclusion is trying to fulfill the will of God is what purpose is, which actually completely coincides with the middle of Job, where in Job, Job gives this. Um, great monologue of the speech of saying how can he appeal to God even when God is so much greater than him and he needs a mediator he needs something to be able to bring God into communication with him so that they can see that right and Wesley would certainly say that's that's Christ so Christ allows you to fulfill the will of God it's not possible for you to do it without him right so but that's going to be the emphasis of the Methodist so you're going to have this this strong emphasis on becoming more like Christ, and that's where we can see the legalism slip in, even though Wesley had pretty good theology behind that, right, is that perfection is possible if you are going to, um, a lot, well, first of all, if you're going to become Christian, and the Holy Spirit is going to, this is the emphasis on the Holy Spirit that we're talking about, the Holy Spirit miraculously makes you more like Christ. It's not that the Holy Spirit is super charismatic and you're going to be out there speaking in tongues and all that. It's that the Holy Spirit is going to form you into being perfect. So core beliefs of Methodism that are very important. Um, so does, first of all, any questions on that? I know I went through that quickly, but that's kind of the main point there. Okay. Nope. Um, so uh, I, I want to stress this again, that they want to teach you that you're trying to be perfect, but it's the role of the Holy Spirit to sanctify you, to put you along that path. And that's like an up and down path, but ultimately the path will go up. Um, and it's a uh, promise that God is a large part of your duty while you're here on earth, is trying to fulfill the will of God. Um, as we already talked about, Arminianism, free will, free will is a huge point of it. Very interestingly, to me at least, is the paedo baptism. So I know that the Southern Baptists were some of the first ones to practice kind of the classical American baptism, but um, the Methodists were with the Reformed, and so the paedo baptism was the way. 
uh, again, Calvin, he writes in the this is Christian religion, that the reason we do that is because um, baptism is the same sort of um, same sort of proof of your faith as circumcision was. And circumcision took place in the, the Old Testament, therefore, um, or it took place with children, therefore baptism should take place with children. And he says just because we don't see children being baptized in the New Testament doesn't mean it's explicitly uh, condemned. But I personally don't hold that view. That was what the Baptists would believe. Um, okay, I'm going to slip to this last slide. Sorry, I went, uh, this clock is wrong, so I went a little bit late. <laughs> but um, five more minutes on this liberal drift. So this is so that's where the method has started. And as you can see, you might disagree exactly on how sanctification takes place or um, how much accountability should be held in the church, how pure the church should be. But um, it was very, very different from what we're going to see in the United Methodists today and very different from what our church believes. Um, we can see this starting in the early 1900s. The Enlightenment, which is this idea of empiricism and like um, natural selection, Darwinianism, these sorts of things, just attack the church and attack it hard in America in the early 1900s and uh, just completely devastates the American church. I mean, really, we're still dealing with it today. Nietzsche, when he tells a story about the death of God, he was predicting that exact thing in the early 1900s. He got it right about 50 years before, um, before it happened. He, he just nailed that right on the head. Um, so the Enlightenment kind of takes a empiricist look to the Bible and says, how can the Bible be true if there's things like miracles and all this take place? And it really came from a German school of thought. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, in the Methodist Specifically, they had 700 American scholars that were ordained underneath them, and 300 of them went to Germany to uh, yeah. study under these philosophers. So highly influenced in the church. Um, they started doing things like um, they would downplay anything spiritual and study the Bible through a reductionist and rational framework. Um, and they reduced the Bible to another piece of literature, which is what many of these pastors would do. Not all of them, but many of them would do this. Um, they thought that revelation was folklore and superstition. Um, they attacked everything from repentance to sin, um, and they wanted to revise Wesley's core teachings on things like the resurrection, the deity of Christ, and like, just really core values. And they made a huge push in the church in the early 1900s, but the Methodists did recover, right? They kind of push it back, but only in a way. So they push it back, to the point of what's called liberal theology, and this is something that's talked about by many theologians today, where they try to take the Enlightenment view of reductionism and put the Bible into that, instead of taking the Bible and pushing it into um, reductionism, right? So it's a very slight theological shift, but it's taking your assumption of faith on either the Bible or on the Enlightenment, right? And we've talked about in this class before, you have to take faith on one of those. You can't prove either one, you just have to decide which one you're gonna take faith on. And every evangelical should take that on the Bible, as, as my claim as an evangelical. Um, the Methodist Church as a whole, the United Methodist Church, didn't do that. They, they went to the other side. Um, and uh, so there's, there's there had a... There to be a split. I mean, there had to be a disagreement within the church about that. For sure, there was. And I, I don't know, that might be where the Free Methodist Church came from. It's around this time period. So, um, well, an interesting side note, so Byron Center Bible Church mm -hmm. uh, was formed by people that left the Byron Center United Methodist Church in the early 60s. Oh, really? Yeah, my, my grandparents, my dad grew up there, was baptized there as an infant, uh -huh. and his parents didn't want to be part of, uh, it really wasn't a split, but they didn't want to be part of that, so they, they went back to my grandmother's wow. childhood home, which was the Moline Baptist Church. Uh -huh. Which is... Was this one right? The one that turned no. into this one? No. Well, Moline Baptist was across the corner from this one. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Close. Yeah. So, um, but that that was kind of the, the theological switch there. All right. But that pretty soon. So that's very modern. If you guys know your philosophy, it's like modernity, right? But modernity falls apart really hard right after World War II. It kind of that was the experiment. It ends in mass genocide, and then we usher into post-modernity, which is all about how you feel. The Methodists kind of just jumped from their modernity to their post-modernity. It's all about how you feel now. And um, we see pretty frequently, and um, I'm not going to get into all the theology behind this. If anyone like, disagrees with me right now, I'd be happy to talk to you later, but we don't have time right now. But it is our church's view. Our church's view is that we're a complementarian church. It means that women can be deacons, but they can't be elders, basically, which is going to be the teachers. 
Um, so in the 60s, which it makes me interesting, or makes me think about your comment, in the 60s of yeah. when the women were first started to be ordained. Um, in 1974, we saw permission of LGBTQ to be allowed into the church. And in 2024, this year, we see the first time that LGBTQ members can be ordained into the church, Methodist church. So um, it just slowly, as you see, like every like 20, 30 years, you see another step. You know what I mean? Where it gets and I would say in practice, if they were, <clears throat> they may not be the official blessing of the church or within their church doctrine, but um, there were gay pastors probably back from the late 70s. I was 100 percent. So, and they would just kind of like they wouldn't denounce it or accept it. They just kind of allowed it. Yeah. So what's interesting about that is they have this thing called the Doctrine of Discipline or the Book of Discipline, and in the 70s they reformed it to take a neutral stance on homosexuality. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yep. And then in 2024 it became affirming. Right. So you see, like it's not it's not like they just switch and say, okay, we're going to ordain gay pastors. It's like we're going to be okay with gay congregants. All right, now we're going to be okay with gay pastors. Yeah. So it's just it was a confusing switch. to talk to someone from the Methodist Church because some would be very much against it, some would be very much for it, and you're like, well, if you're outside of it, you're like, well, what do you believe? You feel right. Like this is kind of a big deal, uh -huh. and it was hard to wrap your brain around their stand on it. So, which is key. Right now, the Methodist Church is in a huge point of turmoil, the United Methodist Church is. Um, in May 2024, one million congregants from the African Ivory Coast Methodist Church um, all left, the entire denomination uh, split. And over this decision that took place in, um, I think like February, uh, the decision was made 692 to 51 for the people that were ordained. And um, that cost them 12% of their members immediately, but the fallout is still coming through today. So um, this is, I don't have time for the rest of this class, but that is, the the point of where we've gotten to the Methodist Church today is like it's actually like we're not like you know for a lot of these guys we'll kind of get to the end and we'll be like all right well that's what they believe but for the Methodists it's like they're in the thick of it right now I mean there's a lot of infighting there's a lot of church splitting and that sort of thing so um, like you were all saying many different ideas of what people actually believe in the Methodist Church and I think within the next ten years we're going to see. Um, whether this church can survive or if it's going to splinter even more. It may, it may even just five years. Right? What is that? It may even just be five years, not, not ten years. Yeah, it could be next year. It, I mean. it, yeah. <laughs> but you never Chaos see last year. Uh -huh. the denomination yeah. get more conservative, typically. You don't. I mean, so, mm -hmm. like, that's the that's where the battle mm -hmm. is. It's like, you're, as an outside observer, <clears throat> they will just continue to get more liberal. Yeah. And so, but that's yeah. true for all denominations. It feels like historically. It's true for politics as well, yeah. Um, and that's why I think the key is that liberal theology. So Wayne Grudem is probably my favorite modern theologian. Mm -hmm. um, also reformed, so I don't agree with him on that too. But he thinks that's the most dangerous part of the church, is this idea of saying, we're gonna take any other philosophy on faith over the fact that God exists and is who the Bible says he is, right? So you have to take something on faith, and to be evangelical, that should be it. Um, I know we should go, but I think one question I have, I want to talk to you guys first about it, because um, I can't, I can't reconcile this in my mind. Um, there's, there's this church that came out in like the, the 90s, maybe a little bit early, maybe it was the 70s, called the Universal Church, mm -hmm. where people got together and worshiped nothing, and it fell apart because they didn't worship anything. So, yeah. so to, to be a group, you have to be exclusive, by definition, in order to be a group, right? What I don't understand about the Methodist Church right now is that um, they include literally everyone. So I don't know, like I don't see any sort of unity in this church, but they've also still survived for about 100 years now since that they kind of adopted a liberal position on politics. It's the coexist whole entire bumper sticker thing, you know, where it's like, yes, we don't agree, you might not be okay with it, but we all have to deal with each other because we're all body of Christ type idea because they consider that we're all you know like even these people that obviously aren't saved because you know they're not really believing anything in Christianity because it's not biblically founded um, yeah. they're like they're our brothers and sisters in Christ and God tells us to get along so we're gonna tolerate each other and worship together and like, then you just get kind of the group of people that are like okay I'm just gonna internalize this I don't mm -hmm. like what's happening but I'm not gonna say anything and I'm not gonna like ask for change yeah. And that's kind of the slippery slope that they've done, which like Pastor John's always like, how much are you going to tolerate before you say no? Right. And they're just a church of tolerance. 
and yeah. coexistence. But I don't know. Full shuffle. Well, yeah, maybe. And, and what's interesting, I, I think, is you know, with the enlightenment, you you see the clergy being enlightened. Yep. Yeah. But the, so the clergy are often much more liberal in theology For sure. than the people in the pews, yeah. you know, which causes this tension. And you had the fundamentalism movement coming in in the early 20th century. Yeah. Which, you know, which is where the yeah. Bible Church comes out of the Methodist yeah. Church in Byron Center because the fundamentalism influence mm -hmm. tension against the, the yeah. more liberal clergy in the United Methodist Church. The oh. Methodist Church. Like, I guess I just don't understand how it's sustainable. Like, won't that fall apart? Well, you but know? you can. I mean, there's a there's a market, I guess you would say, yeah. where I get to have a little bit of God and keep my philosophical beliefs and merge those two without anything spiritually holding me accountable. Maybe. So I think there's yeah. a you know, thing. That's a good point. Yeah. And you mentioned they, their foundation, their starting point, is extremely rock solid. It is. Yeah. And so until they completely move off of their rock, um, yeah, this metaphorical <laughs> scenario, you know, until they eventually move on over to their the sand, there will yeah. still kind of be something there. Because, yes. As you mentioned at the beginning, they yeah, had a very right. very good starting point. Yeah, I and, think you're right. On and that. if you think about it, like it 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 can it can be too simplistic. But yet, for me personally, I think it's, it's legitimate, is that that's a mastermind of Satan yeah. to work, because Satan's in, in the long game. Mm -hmm. And we know that Satan's not omnipresent. He's not, um, there's a lot of attributes of God that Satan doesn't have and he's limited. But if you can work at chipping away from such a solid foundation at the beginning, mm -hmm. and you play the long game, um, and it's always getting, turning people away from the biblical truth. You just get them 5% yeah. away now, the next generation 10% yeah. away, the next generation 30% away. Right. It's, it's masterful it is kind in of, a plan. It's kind of beautiful when you look at it from that perspective, from that yeah. dark perspective, yeah. you know. So, I mean, if that's, if that's something that's going to work, that, that will work. It does work, yeah. Yeah. Yes. It'll play right. out in our eyes. It'll just turn into the Reformed Methodist Church. That when they get back to their original roots, right? Yeah. They'll just change their name to get them back to the original. Yeah, I kind of hope so. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> now that you've noticed that churches don't have the denominational name on anymore. The Methodists don't? Uh, almost all church Methodists. Really? Yeah. CRC is a you, lot more. Churches don't have Baptist out on the sign, Methodist out on the sign. No, they, 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 just, they change the name to something yeah. trendy, but they don't have a denominational name. There's just a lot more non denominational. There are a lot more. But like all the non denominational. Well, well, but you might assume too that they are. Like a lot of people right. talk to Kentwood Community Church, they don't. No, that's a Wesleyan church. It's oh, they're Wesleyan. Wesleyan church. Yeah. Wesleyan. <laughs> 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 they are. 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 They are